Thank you everybody for coming to our STEM speaker series. Um, I'd like to introduce Catherine Stone. Um, she is an engineer and she's also my friend. Um, so we went to college together. Um, and she is serving as the Director of Advanced Operations at Stryker, which is a medical technologies firm. And I'm going to let her take it away and share with you um, her career story. Thanks for coming, Catherine. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Glad to be here. Uh, hi, everybody. This is uh, my first Zoom uh, presentation where I go through this spiel uh, via Zoom. Usually I do this in person and I would much have rather to do it in person, but unfortunately that's not possible uh, right now. So thanks for joining me on Zoom. And uh, yeah, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my career and um, what got me interested in the industry and what kind of roles I've had. And then at the end, um, or if you want to chat any questions that you have, um, or at the end I can take questions, that would be awesome. Um, I started pretty early on in my um, life knowing what I wanted to do. Um, I really wanted to be a ballet dancer, which is not an engineer and has nothing to do with striker. Um, but I had long hours of training and I just was fascinated by ballerinas and all things dance. And uh, I got chosen to go on point and I had a physical uh, to go through to get on point. And during that physical, they diagnosed me with a condition called scoliosis, which is where your spine is curved. And I didn't really know anything at the time what that was like, um, but soon found out that the, the condition was progressing. And um, basically that if it continued to progress, I would need to have surgery. So I went um, two years with a back brace. Um, I tried hanging on a bar for 60 seconds every day for years. Um, that was not good medical advice. Um, basically nothing really worked. And so eventually I had to have surgeries for scoliosis um, where basically they put metal rods in your back to straighten your back and, and kind of like an internal cast while the bones fuse so that it stays in place. And uh, with a fused spine, it's really hard to do ballet because it's a very like flexible art, right? So um, with like a straight back, that's becomes like really difficult. So uh, I had to kind of pivot and determine what I was going to do with my life. And I, you know, I had um, I had a, a physics teacher in high school who said that I should be an engineer. And I said, well, I don't know anything about trains, so I don't know what you're talking about. And then he explained to me that they make, you know, way more than that and that it's way um, a diverse field and that I could even like work on medical stuff that I had just experienced going through this big surgery. So I decided to go to Virginia Tech and major in engineering and math. And I realized that all of the stuff that was in my back was designed by some engineer out there and realized that, you know, people like me could make a difference in patients' lives and um, that maybe people didn't have to go through all the surgeries that I went through because I had to go through three surgeries in high school um, because it kept like not exactly working right. Um, so I figured, well, maybe if I could design a better widget, then it would stay in my back or at least... Um, wouldn't cause me as much pain as what I had gone through in high school. So like Erica said, we went to Virginia Tech together and um, I majored in engineering science, mechanics and math and uh, had some experience with uh, research in spine um, in college. And I wanted to get a job in the spine industry afterwards because I wanted to you know, make patients lives better for this one very unique condition. Um, and I interviewed like all over the place to try to get a job. And I was determined to break into the industry. And a lot of companies, you know, didn't think that I was the right fit. And at Virginia Tech at the time, we didn't have a very big biomedical program. Um, but eventually I found a company called K2M. And that was a very small company in Virginia. And they were totally different. I, I went into the interview and they I told them that I was a patient and they kind of freaked out, but like in a good way, they were like wanting to ask me a whole bunch of questions and they wanted to like feel on my back to see if they could like feel the screws and stuff. Um, 
So like I said, kind of creepy, but also in a good way. And it just really showed that they cared about the patients and they weren't just doing this to make another dollar or whatever for their um, corporate interests. So I joined the K2M team and uh, started out as an engineer, met these like crazy amazing surgeons that could just like totally change a patient, patient save their life. Um, because my condition, because it was caught and we have early medicine, like it really wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, I did have to go through three surgeries, but in, um, let's say in like third world countries or like, um, in Ghana, for example, I went over there to do a mission trip and, um, there's just so many things that they don't have access to that their spines actually twist so much that it like kind of twists in on itself and it can be life threatening sometimes. Um, and the stuff that these doctors do for these patients is amazing. Um, so it was just really, really cool to see all these amazing surgeons and these outcomes. And then to know that, you know, I was a part of that process and I was designing things that was actually like helping them in the OR and I was making things better. Um, it's a really cool sensation to know that like you're a part of that um, total care package. Uh, I did eventually. Um, feel like I was still out of breath and like my own health wasn't where it needed to be. I would, um, you know, go up to the second floor. My building had like two floors and the, the floors were separated by like, I don't know, um, 12 steps maybe. And I, by the time I got up to the 12th step to the second floor, I would be like completely out of breath. And I was super embarrassed about that. Cause I mean, I was young, like 23 or something like that. So I shouldn't have been out of breath by one flight of steps. So I would like hide out in a supply closet and catch my breath before I would go into meetings. Um, but I didn't want to live like that for the rest of, you know, my life. So I talked to my chief medical officer and I talked to uh, another surgeon, um, Dr. Hannibal Bwachi, and they're both world renowned surgeons. Um, totally amazing that my company had been able to connect with them and work with them. And so I decided that I would get another surgery. So my last surgery was in 2008. Um, so it's been quite a while now uh, with no bad side effects. But, you know, I felt at the time I had like fiery feet. I felt like my feet were on fire. Sometimes I would have like numbness and tingling in my hands. And like I said, the shortness of breath and it just like wasn't worth it to um, continue and have that not be fixed. Um, so in my fourth surgery, uh, the surgeon that I used, Dr. Boachi, he had a choice between different companies. And so, like I said, I was working with K2M at the time. And before they take you in to operate on you, they, you know, give you this form. Well, they give you like 500 forms to fill out. And one of the forms is what products they're going to use in your back. And so he had multiple products and I crossed out every single one except for K2M because I knew, like, I was part of the engineering team, so I knew that those products, I knew what they had tested, I knew that they were good products, and that I could trust them, um, so he ended up putting K2M products inside of me, uh, which was cool, and so now I've been sort of a walking billboard ever since, um, but I really, like I said, I had faith in the design, I had helped work on the project, um, I knew what it had tested at, I knew that it was, like, safe and going to be the best for me. Um, and I'm still here. I'm straight spine, doing good, uh, no side effects or anything. And I'm feeling like fully healthy, which is really awesome to say. Uh, like I said, I also was able to go to uh, Dr. Boachi's home country, which is Ghana. And uh, he has this surgery where they take kids from all over Africa, not just Ghana, um, and they get all of these really, really challenging cases uh, because a lot of times in Ghana and in other African countries, they um, they don't know what's wrong with the child. So they, uh, and a lot of times it's very young kids that get these. So um, my condition was about like 65 degrees and other, um, these, these other kids can be over 100 degrees. So way worse than I had experienced. Um, and I only got to be there for two weeks, but it was nothing short of a miracle. Um, these kids, four or five years of age, they don't have enough um, money for their family to travel with them. So sometimes they're completely alone at the hospital, um, but they're super brave and they're just gracious through the entire process. Um, and it was really 
fantastic experience to volunteer there. Um, so I definitely recommend if you ever get to go on a volunteer trip um, overseas, that that was really life-changing experience for me. Um, since then, I decided that management was one of the things that I really liked in my career. Um, I was a development engineer through all of those surgery stories and through my mission work. Um, and so I, I designed products um, and I still have that capacity, but now I manage people. Um, when I started managing people, I just managed one engineer and it was fun to um, see his development and kind of coach him on mistakes that I had made earlier on in my career that I could help avoid him from making. Um, and then I wanted to get more management experience. And in the engineering department at that time, it wasn't really, um, there wasn't really too many opportunities because KTOM was a pretty small company. And so to go up in the chain of management is, is more difficult because either somebody has to leave, um, you know, it, it's just, there's not positions or opportunities very often. But there was an opportunity for me to take a position in quality control and not a whole lot of people, um, I think, are aware of quality control coming into college or during their college careers. Um, everybody's pretty familiar with like somebody has to design the product and engineers design the product. Um, but there's a whole subsection of quality engineering. Um, it does require an engineering degree and it's really making sure that the products are up to spec and what to do with the product if it doesn't meet spec. Can you rework it? Can you change it somehow? Can you, do you have to work with the supplier that you got it from? Um, so that's really interesting. And I was able to lead a team of about 30 people in quality control as a manager. Um, so that was a really good experience for management. It was a really good um, experience to see the operational side of things, the shipping, the distribution, um, the supplier side of things that was really different than just the pure theoretical design. I actually worked with physical product and the fun issues that you have sometimes with getting the physical product from point A to point B um, to our facility and then inspected and out into um, you know hospitals and patient care, which is ultimately where you want the product to be. So after about three years in quality control, I decided to come back into engineering and um, I did miss like the design part of things. It is kind of fun to see something that you created and like your brain came up with and then see a surgeon use it and see it like be successful in surgery is really like, I don't know, you just can't replicate that very easily without being in that department. Um, so I decided to go back to engineering, but instead of like a product that would go to market in let's say a year, I went into more of the pipeline, so more of the advanced concepts like what is the market going to need in five years or 10 years. Um, and so it might not be marketable right away, but it was more broad concepts um, overarching to the whole business. And that was really interesting to see some of the business development deals that went on. Um, so like I said, my company was fairly small. But we did think about um, partnering with other companies, potentially buying technologies that we thought had like really far reaching feature potential. So that was uh, very interesting. And that was a team of maybe five um, engineers that I had. And then I also managed another team um, that was a team of designers that worked on some specialty instruments for our surgeons. Uh, and then most recently, my company was acquired by Stryker. Um, so I went from being in a company of about 500 people to a company of 38,000 people. So that was a very big change. Um, we were kind of a mom and pop like family environment and Stryker is still a family environment, but a very much bigger family. Um, and I think uh, there's just a lot to be said about a large company with lots of capital and lots of ability to send people to training, um, a lot of resources. So there's definitely, I think, pros and cons to being in a small startup environment, which is where I started, to now a large Fortune 500 company, which is where I am today. Um, both of them have pros and cons, um, and it just depends on what you're more comfortable with and how you fit with the company. Um, but so far, Striker has been really, really good. And uh, like I said, has a lot of resources to give its employees. So that's been fantastic. 
Um, so right now I'm in a department called Advanced Operations, and they make sure that the product, um, like the engineer takes the design and makes a concept. And then we take that concept and maybe you've made 10 pieces, maybe 50 at this point. But when you get to the market demand, the market may say we need 500,000 of these pieces. It's one thing to make 50 and it's another thing to make 500,000. And so we make sure that that concept is machinable and reproducible and repeatable enough where we can scale the demand up to 500,000 pieces and we're not having tons of um, distribution problems and just when you scale things up that quickly sometimes you get a lot of issues in the supply chain so we're working with the design to make sure that everything's in place so that that scalability is possible and right now i am overseeing about 20 people um, and they, from a day-to-day -day basis, basically make sure that all the new products are sustainable during the design phase so that we don't have to go back later and say, well, actually, you should have made this dimension a different dimension because now it doesn't fit with this other component. Or, you know, we kind of look at the system globally and make sure that everything's going to run smoothly for the foreseeable future. Um, so that's what I do right now. Um, I think overall throughout my career, I have been focused on a few things, and I think it's important to kind of know what your personal values are. I think a lot of times people don't think about that very often, and it's kind of an abstract concept, I know. Um, but I think having scoliosis and having medical problems early on kind of forced me to reassess what my values were. And I think part of my values has always been helping other people. And that's meant a lot to me. And so throughout my career, whether it was engineering or quality or advanced operations now, it's all still the core to me is about helping other people and making sure that you have um, that impact onto the patient. And I think that's why I get up every day and go to work. Um, you'll realize, much like probably classes are, um, I started out as a computer engineer. <laughs> And that was just not enough. I, I didn't have enough motivation to get out of bed or pull all nighters or work on that big project. I just didn't care enough, honestly. Um, but when I found biomedical engineering and when I found out that, you know, this is going to help people at the end of the day, um, I think I really started to care more and put more effort into it. So I think whatever career you want to go down, um, you just have to really find like what's meaningful to you because it is going to be hard at points, you know, just like classes are hard. You have a whole bunch of exams. Now you have to do all this stuff virtually. I mean, it's hard. And if you don't have that passion behind you, you're not going to want to do it as much as, you know, when you have that drive or reason for doing what you do. So uh, that's basically my spiel. And I thought we could go to question and answer. Sure, that sounds good. Um, there are some questions in the chat. Um, so yeah, I can, I'll read the, the first one. What types of manufacturing processes do you work with regularly? Um, and do you have to, do you often have to redesign or communicate with design team when scaling up for a process or changing a process for a larger batch? Yeah, th that's great questions. Um, so Basically, in spine, our um, manufacturing is typically with metals. So um, because it's um, a implant that has to go into the body, um, you really you can only use a certain amount of materials because um, the FDA only allows you to use a certain amount of materials. So typically, we work with titanium uh, and cobalt chrome are the two main metals that we use in our products for implants. And then for instruments, we use a whole bunch of different stainless steels. Um, and there's a few other materials, but basically it's a lot of milling, CNC, lathing, that kind of thing, um, that kind of take a bar or a, um, a block of metal and then uh, turn it down or machine it down into the required shape. Um, so those are some of the processes that we work with. And we very, very often, like 100% of the time, I would say, have to 
communicate with the design team to make sure that when we scale up, we're not going to be in a bad situation. Um, it's a really collaborative effort, I would say. Um, so much so that when they go to approve their drawings, um, we are on the approval route. So like they can't really approve anything until we give it the blessing to say that yes, um, it can be manufactured. And we're also looking to make sure that it can be inspected too, um, because if a process requires 100% inspection or um, some sort of like uh, verification that it's correct, and you can't inspect it, then you can't check it and you don't know if it's right. So um, there's a lot of things that look good in CAD, but then when you actually try to measure it, it's really difficult. Um, so then we have to communicate back to the design team and tell them, we're sorry, your design is great, but your baby is just a slightly ugly and we just want to make it a little tweak. Um, so that's always super fun. <laughs> All right. Um, the next one is about internships. Um, are there remote internships that are project based through Striker? Yeah. So Striker has many, many internships. It's like I said, a very large company. They also have a very, um, I would say, rigorous application process that starts very, very early. Um, so we have our interns for this summer. Some of the divisions I know do co-ops. Um, K2M used to do co-ops during the spring and fall terms, um, but uh, Spine right now isn't doing co-ops um, just because we're integrating between K2M and Stryker. We're integrating those two businesses together, and um, it, yeah, it just didn't make sense for us to kind of have co-ops and not really know what to tell them to do uh, because we're still trying to figure out which system we're going to follow. Um, so once that gets up and running, I think um, I think we'll go back to having co-ops and internships um, but everything is on the striker career site so if you search striker careers you'll come up with everything all right the next one what kind of design software do you work with most frequently yeah so or like i said we're sort of integrating between two different um companies right now so we're kind of having a war of cad softwares because of course we used one software and the other group used a different cad software um, so Stryker used uh, Creo, and then uh, K2M used SolidWorks, and we are still trying to figure out which package we're going to go with. But right now, if you are in Leesburg, which is the K2M uh, base, and now the new headquarters for Spine, um, you would use SolidWorks. And then if you're in Allendale, which is the base for Stryker, um, you use Creo. And, um, we're talking about having everyone have both packages because for the legacy drawings, we have to be able to pull all of those up. Um, but eventually I'm sure we'll decide on one package and go with that. But they're both really good software. Like if you know SolidWorks or Creo, um, you're gonna be set for industry. Um, all right, thank you. Um, do you design your own QC? And do you design your own tolerance range? Yeah. So. Typically, the designers in R&D will pick the tolerance range. Um, sometimes they get a little crazy um, and they think that everything needs to be super tight, which in some cases, it, it totally can be very tight tolerance. And our, our machinists are very, very good um, and they can hold very tight tolerances, um, similar to aerospace industry has to have very tight tolerances. But tight tolerances drive cost. Um, and so it is a business still, and you wanna make sure that you are putting tight tolerances on a drawing uh, because there's a need for it, not just because that's like the default in the SolidWorks or CAD program. Um, so sometimes we question, especially if it's the default tolerance block, um, we question, is there any way to um, you know, loosen this up? Because the, the wider the tolerance band, the easier it is for our machinists to hit, and typically the cheaper the product. So we're always looking to balance that like design need with the cost of the product. Yeah, but um, something I always mention to students in engineering graphics. Um, all right, another question, let's see, is, is an experience or advanced degree required to get into the business side of engineering? I would say not really. I mean, I have a master's degree, but um, 
that's just what I chose to do. I, I don't think it's required by any means. Um, it might make it a little bit easier because um, I know for my grad program, we had to write um, business cases and we had to do more like marketing um, projects, which helped me understand like supply chain and um, intellectual property. Uh, sometimes, especially if you're going to be working in a medical device, it's highly regulated. So you'll need to know um, some of the FDA or ISO regulations to make sure that you're compliant, because if you are not compliant, they can come in and shut your company down. Um, so it's really important to know the boundaries in which you're working. Uh, so yeah, I would say it's not required, but it might help you. All right, let's see. Oh, how has COVID-19 affected working at Stryker Medical? Oh man, um, that's a great question. Uh, it is a different world, I will say. Uh, we, we got sent home, all non-essential employees got sent home uh, March 12th, I wanna say. Um, Stryker has taken very, very, I would say conservative, but, but safe, safety in mind approaches. Um, we're all work from home until at least June 30th. Um, so from what I hear from my friends, this is a pretty conservative approach that right out of the gate, they already predicted that it was gonna be at least until June 30th. Um, any essential employees were sent home to work 100% um, from home. Uh, and uh, anybody who had to touch the product is still going into work, um, but we're doing temperature checks and uh, before you enter the facility, everyone wears PPE, um, you know, the N95 masks to pr protect everyone. Um, so there's less risk uh, than there could be going into the office. And then obviously we're, we're keeping those social distancing rules in place. So a lot of workstations um, had to be kind of spread out because they were less than six feet. Um, so in highly uh, trafficked areas, uh, we have a big like conveyor belt where the product all goes down to be inspected. Um, we had to space that out a little bit more. So there's definitely been changes and I work from home 100% now and I get to be on Zoom calls all day long and it's just great. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, all right, does your department bring in or work with outside doctors to design things they need or do you have products established that you're always working on? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so. We constantly need to keep the pipeline up to date. Um, that, that may mean taking an old system and kind of giving it a facelift. Um, or if a system has been out in the market for, let's say, a year or two, um, we should be constantly doing post-market follow-up where we're asking our surgeons who use the product, like, hey, how can we make this better? Um, we look at complaints that surgeons file and see if there's any consistency in that. Um, to make sure that we are, um, you know, making improvements as needed and making sure that if there's anything wrong with the product, obviously we're addressing that very quickly. Um, some of the things, there's, it's not necessarily something wrong with it. Usually it's just kind of like a surgeon preference thing. Um, we might have had a handful of doctors review it in the beginning and they felt like, you know, they wanted it one way. And then when we um, distribute it to a larger market. They, the surgeons more often have a different opinion, not necessarily wrong or, you know, something is catastrophic. It's just preference. And we realize, oh, well, maybe we should offer both styles of handle or something like that. So we're constantly doing like small things to um, upgrade our products and make sure that they're still serving our community. Um, and then we're also constantly looking for that big leap forward in technology. Um, something that our competitors haven't thought of that's like truly innovative and new. So it's kind of a hybrid approach that we have of, you know, working on stuff and keeping it, um, keeping the old stuff refreshed enough to still serve our customers, but then also looking forward to really like bring something new to the market. Um, are your products sold abroad and does, how does that work with different national health agencies in other countries? Yeah. So, um, our products are sold abroad, um, many, many countries, and it is very difficult to try to figure out 
uh, all the different regulations. That's why we have regulatory. Um, and sometimes even the regulatory um, professionals have engineering degrees because it's such a technical field um, sometimes to describe to a different health agency um, the tech technical aspects of a product, you really need an engineering degree just to figure out how to explain it to somebody. Um, so there's a lot of people actually in the company that have engineering degrees that aren't doing like your traditional design um, role. But yeah, definitely we have a whole department that looks at the different um, regulations in every country and make sure that we're compliant. And um, we also have field like sales professionals that sell the technology and they're based in each country. Um, so they go and work with those, um, you know, doctors that we have a Spain contingent, they work with the Spanish surgeons. Um, every market is slightly different. So it's helpful to have, you know, kind of like a customizable approach in each market. Um, let's see. Next question is, can you talk about being a woman working in an engineering field and did you seek out female mentors early on in your career? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's definitely um, male dominated for sure. A lot of times I am the only woman in the room, uh, especially since now I am a director level um, being higher in the organization, there tends to be even less females um, at the higher levels. Um, Stryker is excellent though, I will say, in diversity and inclusion. Um, they have metrics on diversity and inclusion. Um, I actually run our women's um, employee resource group, Stryker Women's Network. Um, so a lot of things have helped. Um, just having that network in place is helpful. Um, sometimes you just need to vent to people who you know know your work and know the situation. Um, early on in my career, I actually did um, seek out mentorship. That was one of the really good things that I think I did for my career. Um, I was super nervous, but I went to what was the highest ranking woman in the company in my, I think, second year on the job. And I asked her to be my mentor, even though I didn't really know her, which can be problematic. Try to ask someone that you know, at least a little bit. Um, <laughs> but she did say yes. And then later on, about four years later, she was telling the story to somebody else, a colleague I was in the room, um, of how we got to, you know, be mentor or mentee. And she was saying that, um, she's in customer service and she was saying that she was so nervous when I asked her to be a mentor. And I was like, you were nervous. I was nervous. What are you talking about? And she said that she was nervous because I was an engineer and she was customer service. And so she wasn't sure if I was going to ask her like all these technical questions that she wasn't going to be able to answer. And so it was really interesting just to hear like we were both nervous and for silly reasons, like we we developed a really great relationship and still have it to this day. So definitely recommend uh, everybody should have a mentor. Yeah, and I would like to say Catherine's one of my mentors. Um, and <laughs> Uh, that that has helped me out tremendously in life uh, just figuring out you know even if you're you, we are engineers but even if you weren't just like finding someone that can show you how to uh, you know get through all the hoops in life like that it's it's good to find an internship and a co-op and that's yep. uh mentors are always helpful yep for sure um okay let's see do you find that there's a difference in backgrounds wanted for jobs with more of a research focus than manufacturing difference a difference in background focus. okay um i would say that overall i've seen a pretty wide variety of backgrounds um both in like more the research side of things and the manufacturing side of things um, we've had people with biology degrees and um, not even engineering degrees. There's there's a lot of different ways that you can enter the medical device space, and it kind of it's an industry that I think lends itself to a whole bunch of different degrees, um, and you kind of can attack the same problem from multiple angles. And it's really good too to have somebody that's not an engineer or not you know kind of went through the same training as you because it gives you like another perspective to look at the problem. Um, we've had marketing people come up with ideas that we've patented before, 
Um, you don't have to be an engineer to have a good idea. So I think there's a ton of different um, backgrounds that we've had, you know, come into the company. I will say that to have an engineering title, um, typically they're pretty strict on an engineering degree. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're not just one of the team once you're in the company. Um, so yeah, I would say it, it doesn't really matter what your background is as long as you have the experience to back up whatever you're trying to do, whether that's research or manufacturing. All right, and next one. In terms of developing new products five to 10 years out, how do you plan slash target the market segmentation? Yeah, that's a really good question and like also extremely challenging to do. And I, I don't know if we have any secret sauce. Um, Give us your secrets. We, <laughs> yeah, and if I did, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think it's about, you know, I, I always felt like it's about communicating with your customers. To me, the whole name of the game is who are you trying to help? Yes, it's the patient, right? Ultimately, you want to have a good experience for the patient. But honestly, your customer is more the surgeon than the patient because the patient's asleep when they're getting surgery. <laughs> so the surgeon is the one actually using your tools and is going to be able to tell you if they're good or not. Um, so as long as you keep in contact with your customer, whoever that is, in my case, it's surgeons, um, I think you have a good chance in targeting what the market breakdown is going to be in five to 10 years because they're the experts and they know if they, if you listen to them and if you get a wide variety of surgeons giving you feedback, you're going to see um, trends, right? You're going to get that data and you're going to be like, oh wow, six out of the seven people that I asked or 60 out of the 70 people that I asked say X. And so we really should in invest in this market segment because they all think that this is going to be like the next big thing. Um, Typically, it's sort of like herd mentality. If your customers want one thing, um, that's typically what they're going to want until you give it to them, and then they're going to want the next thing. So um, I just think keeping in contact with your customers and making sure that you're satisfying their needs are, you know, the best way to kind of keep ahead of the market. Good question. All right. Does anybody else have questions? Anyone want to jump in? Can we get them all? They were coming in really quick there for a second. I know. I think <laughs> we, we might have. We might have uh... answered everyone's questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, if that's everything, then I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for telling us your story. Yeah. It was great to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs>